Um, thank you for watching that. The extract that you watch was of Basil Fawlty, um, who is pretending to inspectors to the wrong people um, and grovelling to them. And I think that that can be indicative of a sort of panic-stricken teacher who is being very performative, um, who is aiming just to sort of do and seem to be doing the right things rather than genuinely learning. And I think that Basil Fawlty exemplifies at its extreme what we might call a performative attitude to learning. Um, he just wants to appear to be uh, good. He's not actually interested in um, improving his own competence, he wants to prove his competence. Um, and so I think he's quite a good illustration of what not to do as a kind of leader. Quite interesting. He doesn't have a learning orientation, which is something that Alison was talking about earlier. And we know from a lot of research in lots of different fields in education that when you start to see yourself as a learner, as a teacher, you improve and you also have better well-being, um, which is my, what my talk is about. You, because you embrace mistakes and you see um, those mistakes, you see the kind of pain of learning as part of the job, um, rather than trying just to constantly be proving your competence. We go to the next one. Um, so, happiness and teacher well-being. We've got the Basil Fawlty teaching style, constantly seeking ways to be happy. That's quite interesting, isn't it? Because all of the shows, he's trying to get a, you know, a, a kick out of um, doing something that's going to give him sort of pleasure. Uh, whether it's kind of betting, whether it's proving to inspectors that he's a great uh, hotelier. Um, He's a perfectionist, ironically, for all of his mistakes, he's constantly <coughs> seeking to be perfect and appearing to be perfect. Um, and that is in quite opposition to what I might call more mindful teaching, which is acknowledging and accepting suffering and happiness. Where the, the, uh, the job comes with it, a degree of pain, and that, you know, learning to accept and acknowledge your pain is actually an important part of the job. Um, often ignored um, and rather than being a perfectionist this great phrase from um, a, a psychologist Winnicott is really uh, good I think good enough being good enough is okay um, and that that is you know what we're aiming for faulty is very punitive um, so he's constantly gaining a sense of self-worth by humiliating others. And I think that, you know, having a teaching style that is trying to get a sense of power by punishing others, um, can, whether it's other staff or children, in small and big ways, can be quite destructive. Um, and he never learns from his mistakes um, because he won't acknowledge them. Um, and that's in opposition to this idea of being kind to yourself, mindful teaching is about learning to start with yourself, learning to be kind to yourself, learning to kind of have this kind of terrible phrase, self-care, as it were. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then, you know, seeing your mistakes as points for learning. I think that's a very important element to developing yourself as a teacher, but also embracing, you know, a, an attitude of mind that is about your own well-being. Um, yes, can we go to the next slide? I think it's very important to look at the big picture, though. For all our kind of points, I'm going to give you pointers about kind of developing your own well-being. Um, if we just go to the next bit, uh, let's remember, in this austerity Britain, um, a third of students do not eat breakfast if the school does not provide it. And you, many of you will be working in environments where you'll be coming across students who are coming from very deprived backgrounds. And being aware of that is important. And ultimately, you can't solve that. That's a wider political issue that we'll look at in a minute. And that's one. Eight out of ten students um, in the secondary level this was, but I'm sure it's relevant to primary too, um, report feeling so stressed the previous year that they felt they were unable to cope um, from a psychologist just published uh, this month. Um, so you, you will be encountering many, many students who are finding having great challenges with their well-being too. 
I want to kind of widen things. So we've got this picture of you going to work in a society that is very unequal and where stress and mental uh, ill health are very common. Okay? I think that thinking in terms of well-being in a big picture way is really important for teachers. There's a very interesting uh, thinker called Kate Raworth, in, and she's written a book called Donut uh, Economics, which is about this. I'm just going to briefly explain it now. If you are interested in following up on this, look, the slides will be available to Una. Underneath this slide is a link to her YouTube videos and her work. Um, it's well worth looking at in depth. Um, if you're interested in this area. Anyway, her point is, her big point is, that when we start to get human well-being right, when we start to think about ourselves in the big picture, we also start to get the planet's well-being right. So she's kind of thinking quite big, that actually when you start caring for yourself properly, in the right way, when you start having things like gender equality, when you have things like decent housing, when you have kind of social networks that are nourishing and healing for people, when you have kind of proper renewable energy that people can use, when there's running water in many parts of the world that people don't have access to clean water, which is a really important issue. Um, food and health and education, all of these things, they are key uh, thing, factors that lead to people's well-being. And that's, so let's think about those things. When those things have got right, you then start to get the bigger picture things like um, air quality right. Uh, you start to have biodiversity getting um, right. So food, one of her key points is that you know, if you eat healthfully and don't eat too much meat, that actually has a really big impact on the environment because eating of meat is a major <coughs> contributor to CO2 emissions. Um, so all of those things contribute to um, your own well-being but also the planet's. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. <coughs> so let's look at the modern school teacher where there are multiple demands being put on you, aren't there? There's the dishevelled hair, um, from getting up at five after going to bed at uh, one in the morning. Um, you're constantly kind of giving money out uh, out of your own pocket to provide things. Um, there's uh, lots of multiple duties to do, traffic duty, playground duty, cafeteria duty, um, and, you know, dealing with pranks and lesson plans and uh, notes. Uh, from parents saying teachers get paid too much or have too much holiday. So there's kind of lots of kind of strains on the modern school teacher that is worth kind of being aware of and accepting the pain of that, accepting that it is difficult. It's not an easy process. Um, let's go on to the next slide. And when we look at the sti statistics for teacher attrition or dropout rates in the uh, workplace, um, recently, you can see from this statistic, in 2017, um, roughly four out of ten teachers are dropping out of the profession within five years. Um, so there's a massive uh, attrition rate of over 40%. Um, and you can see why, because there are these multiple strains on the system. Um, the austerity environment, but also the kind of multiple strains within the work environment. I'll go on to the next one. <coughs> However, and this really interests me, I want to kind of open a conversation about this, the government are really wanting to try and address this issue of teacher workload. And I think a message to um, take out into schools is, and it is on this slide, is that actually, you know, there's quite a lot of areas where you can significantly reduce your workload um, in discussion with the people in your schools. So, for example, there's a big drive, and there's a lot of links underneath this slide, to try and cut down teacher marking load, um, at wh which is involving in-class marking of work, which is involving um, using assessment for learning techniques such as having one sheet that you write on when looking at a set of books. Rather than marking in the individual books, you write, write on one sheet what, what the targets are, what are the strengths. 
and that that is centrally held and put into the books. It's much less time consuming and actually the research evidence is that it's actually much better for the students um, rather than uh, constantly scouring the book. So that sort of approach is really helpful. Um, and they are expecting, you know, not expecting you to do things like lesson plans. Ofsted, this is a myth and detailed um, kind of bureaucracy based on um, your teaching. We'll go on to the next bit. So, um, I wanted to point out to you another kind of um, well-being technique that I have found very helpful in my own practice. Mm -hmm. um, this is the embarrassing mm -hmm. bit. Um, it's called Five Rhythms. Has anyone come across Five Rhythms? A few of you, yeah. Um, five Rhythms is a movement technique. And what I would say, given the kind of context I've looked at, is that obviously there are certain things that you cannot change um, because there's just a big political environment, a social environment, where things are you know, really uh, tricky to deal with. However, there are lots of things that you can nurture your own well-being regarding. And actually, government are supportive of this. They want you to be doing things like setting up sports clubs, doing dance, um, doing things like mindfulness. Um, they want schools to generate these sorts of uh, kind of cultures of well-being. Um, so do look on the kind of links underneath the slides here. Five rhythms I found very kind of emancipatory for me. Um, and what five rhythms is, is a mode of dance, which I'm going to, it's quite tricky, to try. I, I'm going to demonstrate it in a minute. Um, uh, it's a mode of dance whereby you follow the kind of five rhythms of what the inventor of it, Gabriel Roth, who is a dancer from the 70s and 80s and 90s, and who worked with a lot of young people. She also worked with disabled people. She worked with people with depression. And she worked with professional dancers too. So, you know, it's quite an interesting thing. And I found attending it in the last year, classes for it, really liberating experience. Again, there's a link underneath this slide if you want to have a look at uh, following it up. And the basic idea is that uh, life follows five rhythms. The first rhythm is flow, and I'm going to start doing it now. The first rhythm is flow, and that's the kind of flow of childhood. That is the flow that you are dealing with. People are laughing, some people want to hide, as I start doing <laughs> The flow of childhood. And the flow of childhood is a natural rhythm that you just do and have this kind of flow to it. Um, a lesson can begin with flow, too. You can just... <coughs> get people to come in and do a drawing or do some free writing of something. The second rhythm moves in to, towards a teenage kind of attitude and this is where you have a more staccato rhythm and it is kind of like this, you know, it's where that kind of teenage sort of anxiety and that teenage kind of angst comes out and it's really quite Staccato, like. <laughs> um, the next rhythm is even worse. It's chaos. <laughs> and you're just going like this. And you really are in your 20s, 30s. Life is confusing. You don't know what you're doing. You're doing this. And it's chaos. Then the next rhythm, thankfully, is a bit smoother, and that's lyricism, kind of linked to flow, but it's people who can dance might do it a bit of ballet, not that I can. <laughs> and that's the kind of wisdom of uh, being 50, 60, older, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> yeah. And that's lyricism. So you start to see the poetry in your memories. You start to look back. You start to reflect. And that's something that can happen in a lesson too. Towards the end of a lesson, having had your chaotic moment of frenetic action and your staccato, you might want to get the students to reflect back and write some reflections on what they've learned. And then the final rhythm is stillness. 
where you just are, <coughs> obviously at the end of your life, you're dead and not And of course, you don't want your children to be dead at the end of a lesson. <laughs> but you do possibly want them to be still and to find a degree of stillness before they go on to the next lesson. So the five rhythms are not only the rhythms of life, but they could be the rhythms of a lesson. They could be the rhythms of a day. Um, they, the rhythms go in waves. So once the stillness has come, the wave starts up again with flow. Um, I found it very kind of liberating and uh, really helpful for me. I think any of these sorts of activities where you can sort of move and have permission to do things. I think the crucial thing about five rhythms is when you're with a good instructor or you're doing it by yourself, it's about giving yourself permission to move, to feel. And you'll notice here, a year ago, before doing this class, I just couldn't have done that, uh, embarrassing myself like that. But I've been in the class often enough now just to give myself permission to move as I want to move and to dance and to feel that dance. I've never learned any dance in my life, obviously, as you can see. You know? <laughs> um, but I, I do love that kind of dancing movement. Um, so we're just going to the next bit. And so just to finish, I think that the key thing is that love wins through. And of course, I mean appropriate love within the context of your um, pupils. Um, but the Greeks, the Greeks have five different words for love, and I think that you know one of them is about sort of love between um, the older generation, the younger generation, that is about education and learning. And I think that that often is you know what's appropriate for teachers. Obviously, um, the Beatles said it, all the religions of the world have say this kind of message that, you know, taking this sort of loving attitude to yourself and to other people does triumph in the end, even though there's a kind of painful process involved. 